Uh, we're starting off the day with two really, really terrific authors, uh, Vera Kurian and Ashley Winstead. Vera is a writer and scientist based in Washington, D.C. Her debut novel, Never Saw It Coming, was published by Park, Park Row Books and Harville Secker Vintage in the U.K. in September. Uh, her short fiction has been published in magazines such as Glimmer Train, Day One, and The Pinch. She has a PhD in social psychology where she studied intergroup relations, ideology, and quanti uh, quantitative methods. That sounds like a perfect background for thrillers. <laughs> Ashley Winstead is the author of In My Dreams, I Hold Nights, Not A Knife, Fool Me Once, and, and the forthcoming thriller The Last Housewife a graduate of Vanderbilt University with a PhD in English from Southern Methodist University. She's worked in academia, the music industry, the entertainment industry, and, phil and philanthropy. I loved both of these books. If you haven't read them, you're in for a treat. If you have read them, don't tell who, who did it. Right? <laughs> um, so our moderator today is Allison Leota, another fantastic <laughs> author. Allison uh, is a novelist, former sex crimes prosecutor, and TV critic who focuses on what TV crime drama do gets right and gets wrong. I love police procedurals, so that could be a day in and of itself. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Allison served as the assistant U.S. attorney in Washington before turning to fiction. Uh, she's a graduate of Harvard Law, Law School and Michigan State University. She's been dubbed, I love this quote, she's been dubbed the female John Grisham, but her goal is for Grisham to be dubbed the male Allison Liotta. So thank you. Thank you so much. We are, can you guys hear me? Great. We're so excited to be back in Gaithersburg in person with book lovers. So thank you for everything you do to make this happen. We love this book festival. And I'm super excited to be here today with two of the hottest new mystery authors to break into the scene this year. Two uh, debut authors who've had the kind of success that everyone who writes a novel hopes to have. Uh, Vera Kurian, your debut novel is Never Saw Me Coming. I'm gonna have you hold it up so people can take their picture of you with it. <laughs> there, lovely. Um, it was named a most anticipated novel of 2021 by Newsweek, Goodreads, Pop Sugar, and Crime Reads. And you were nominated for the most prestigious award in the mystery writing community, the Edgar Award. Congratulations. <laughs> and Ashley, your debut novel, In My Dreams, I Hold a Knife. Please, your close up. <laughs> it got the coveted rave review in the New York Times. It is currently an Amazon editor's pick, and you have over 24,000 reviews on Goodreads. So you've both had this remarkable success out of the gate. The first thing I want to know is, how does it feel? Um, oh, hopefully you can hear me. I would actually say it feels very um, not real. But the I, I don't know exactly when your book deal was, but mine was like, June of 2020, so everything felt super surreal, and each thing kept happening, and I was like, okay, okay that's real. Um, so it probably won't fully register until after the fact, when people come up to you and say something like about Edgar Awards or something, and you're like, oh, okay, like that happens. That's good, but then you are really anxious about the next thing, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah, I will add, you know, as a writer, you're working alone, you're in solitude, and so you're sitting there writing your book, chipping away, and thinking to yourself, is anyone going to read this, you know, um, is this going to resonate with anyone? Um, so I think the thing that, I, I'm very grateful just that the book is finding readers, and has brought a lot of people into my life, um, readers and other writers. Um, but like Vera said, the way you know our minds work is constantly, OK, what's next? Right. That's good, but what's coming up? Right. Yeah, I know that publishing a book can be a surreal experience alone. And then to do it in the middle of a pandemic is super surreal. So c congratulations. And it, I, I'll pinch you if you want. But it's, <laughs> it's all happening. So your, your book is, uh, it features, I think, one of the freshest protagonists that I've read in a long time. You have seven psychopaths. 
who are getting a free ride to a fictional DC university. And, uh, you know, you delve into this world of psychopaths. I'm wondering how did you come to that idea? And, uh, you know, how, how did you make this character, your main character, Chloe, so interesting and likable despite the fact that she doesn't have any empathy? Um, I think it was a combination of, well, I'm a true crime fan, so I've always been interested in like serial killers and that kind of thing. And uh, in my background in psychology, I've always been interested in psychopathy because the way the mind of a psychopath works is completely different. Like they don't feel guilt or empathy and they're also really like narcissistic. Um, so I think uh, I wrote the book because I was kind of frustrated where in mysteries where like the main, the main female character was kind of like hapless and like lacking in basic reasoning skills <laughs> <laughs> or agency. So I wanted to write a really agentic, intelligent character who wanted something. And then I wanted to basically create this awful person that readers would find themselves against their will, like really drawn to, and like maybe even root for. Um, and I think she's, she is a terrible person, but she's still super charming because A, it's exciting to see her do what she's doing. You kind of want her to do it. She wants to kill someone. Um, but also she's funny, and it's really hard to dislike people who are funny. Um, so, yeah, as I was writing her, I didn't intend for her to be funny, but it just kind of came out because she's judgmental, so therefore she's snarky. Um, yeah. So it kind of came that way. And I think it's also funny just seeing this girl try to be this normal college student when she's not kind of processing it the same way that you know a normal student would. So there's that element of humor there. And also, I think it helps that the person she's trying to kill is a bad guy. Terrible, terrible human being. Yeah, so you're, you're kind of rooting for that in this sort of vengeance yeah. way. Yeah. Actually, your book has been described as a mashup of The Breakfast Club and Pretty Little Liars, mm -hmm. two, two of everybody's favorites. And your protagonist is Jessica Miller, this beautiful woman who seems to have this perfect life. She has, uh, she's the youngest woman ever to be named a partner in her consulting firm, and she's got this great wardrobe, this great apartment, but she is just tortured on the inside by her past and by insecurities. Um, how did you go about creating this character? Yeah, uh, Jessica would be thrilled to hear you call her beautiful and <laughs> successful because she's trying real hard. Um, I, Jessica was, like, is the heart of, of In My Dreams, for me, it's uh, she's she came to me first. This character, um, and then everything else, plot, um, setting, was all second. As I tried to figure out, you know, what is this woman going to do, and and how. But I started imagining Jessica um, in full full honesty at a very emotionally low point in my life. Um, it was a, a moment when I had experienced really profound failure in my writing career. Um, and despite trying for many years, I, you know, one more knock and I um, kind of was grappling with this thought that maybe I should just throw in the towel as a writer and it just wasn't going to happen for me. And I was just going to have to get used to that. Um, and so I was thinking about that, um, and as writers do, you kind of can't help where your imagination picks up and starts going. Um, and of course, so my brain was like, we could throw in the towel, or what if, what would a woman look like who absolutely refused to do that? Like, um, what would someone look like who refused to abide, like wouldn't abide failure, was going to do whatever she t it took to force the world to see her the way that she sees herself. Um, and what kind of dark things would she do? What lengths would she go to to um, you know, make the world recognize her? So Jessica just kind of sprung into my mind from those sort of hypotheticals. Yeah, and I found both of your protagonists to be just so sympathetic and relatable because they're, they've got these things that are driving them, they've got, um, you know, the pressure we all feel as women to kind of be perfect and present this face to the world, but they're, they've got these demons they're dealing with inside, 
they also have these flaws, mm -hmm. and you guys both kind of step close to the line of making them unlikable, which is something that we as authors talk about a lot. How close can your protagonist be to being unlikable? Can they be unlikable? Um, how did you guys approach that? The you know, including the flaws, but will they will readers like them? I think for me, the likability was was irrelevant. Um, I wanted to write a person, and the person is who they are. And if the author, there are some readers who want characters to like be their friends, and that's very strange to me because <laughs> the best moral person is not an interesting person. I think this is why the ratings of my book are very polarized because some people are like, "These are bad people." Like, yes, they are psychopaths. Um, I think that. Uh, I, sh the more interesting thing is like, okay, how do you write a really smart character, but s you don't want them to be like Miss Perfect who has every single skill. So like a major flaw of hers is what, one, she's not capable of feeling fear. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about a world that's dangerous without getting killed if you don't feel fear, if fear is a survival instinct? So that's one. The second is that she assumes she's smarter than everyone, which is a major blind spot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's a line in the book about, like, I don't have a lot of flaws, but a complete lack of humility is one of them, <laughs> which was a joke, but it's also true. Like, you know, being humble is something that keeps you, like, safe and, like, in a social network. Um, so that was something that I had to be, she's also impulsive, which is part of psychopathy. So if you're trying to do this careful plan to kill someone without getting caught and you're really impulsive and can't control your, your you know, baser instincts, that kind of becomes a problem for her a few times in the book. Yeah, I, I would say um, I wrote Jessica for her unlikability. Like that was why I wanted to write her as a character. Um, she, so it, it was very intentional on my part and Jessica wrestles with her unlikability throughout the entire book. So she's trying, she, she recognizes that there are parts of her that are unlikable. And, you know, by the way, that's like her ambition and her, her desire to get ahead, um, which I would argue aren't necessarily unlikable, um, but tend to be a little bit when um, women exhibit those, um, you know, those qualities. So anyway, Jessica is like, if there's anything that unravels her, and makes her break bad more than anything else, it's her wrestling with her unlikability and her constant attempts to sublimate what is unlikable about her and put on um, a likable mm -hmm. exterior. And so that was kind of my, <laughs> my um, wrestling with that and kind of meta commentary about women and, and how we do that. So when readers also say about Jessica, oh, this is a really unlikable person, um, you know, I'm like, yes, exactly. That, that is the point, like, the in, that is what the book is about. Right, I mean, we write murder mysteries, so. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and now I'm gonna ask you a question that gets asked to me a lot, and I, and I think uh, as debut novelists, a lot of us take the elements from our own life. Like, mm -hmm. they say, write what you know, right? So debut authors very often are mining their own lives for bits and pieces. I was a sex crimes prosecutor, so my character, Anna Curtis, who's a series character, is a fictional sex crimes prosecutor at the U DC U.S. Attorney's Office. So I'm always asked, how much of Anna is you? So I'm gonna turn that question to you guys and ask, um, Ashley, how much of Jessica is you? I noticed that she goes to this elite Southern University, you went to Vanderbilt, so what, what else is there? What did you take, what did you, what is not you? Yeah, I always, my first disclaimer when I'm um, attending book club meetings and, and other things is to say, I am not Jessica Miller. <laughs> um, and I know that I've convinced people finally when they stop like side-eyeing me and um, <laughs> you know, giving me a face. But you know, as, as you said, there, I actually can't write, because I've, I've written a few books now, and I cannot uh, flow in my writing until I figured out what piece of me I am putting in the book. And so finding that personal inroad, um, and you know, with Jessica, I've already confessed to this, so I'll just lean into it, but I kind of like carved out fear of failure, 
desire to be important, you know, all these things that as humans we, uh, fear of smallness that we wrestle with and put that in Jessica and the other characters as well. And then gleefully and, and shamelessly also pillaged Vanderbilt uh, and my undergrad experience for that uh, Southern Ivy kind of college setting. Yeah, and I like how you had, like, she is thinking of herself in this dichotomy. She's like, old Jessica, new Jessica, extraordinary Jessica, mediocre Jessica. Yeah. She cannot figure out who she is, and she's looking at other people to tell her. Yeah. And now, Vera, you have this amazing background in psychology. You're st you studied social psychology. You've got these clinician characters who are kind of delving into what your area of expertise is and obviously you've got these psychopaths who are all no spoilers here but they start perhaps killing each other on campus um, how did you how did you mine your own past for your characters um, so you you'll see the book is about um, a clinical panel study at the university where the seven psychopaths go so there's a psychology department and I spent a lot of time in a psychology department um, and there's a professor and his graduate student, and that is a relationship that's I'm really familiar with. And what what is that like? There's also a lot of like experiments that the seven psychopaths have to do in the book that are actually um, very classic social psychology uh, things. If you've ever taken a class, you'll recognize them right away. Um, so I think my my background was more in studying like politics and things like how do you measure things. But because of my background, I was able to consume a lot of information that was um, not written for a general audience about psychopathy. So I could kind of make sure that this was an accurate representation, not just like a sensationalist, yeah. sensationalistic representation. But I mean, if anyone is questioning, there is none of me in this book. <laughs> like I don't have psychopathy. Uh, I don't really do like auto fiction. Where, where you can see me, I think, is in. Um, the humor and social commentary and like there's kind of hmm. even if it's done in kind of like a oblique way there's kind of commentary about sexual politics and and, and violence and uh, racism the things that kids are talking about on campus mm -hmm. now um, there's a backdrop of there being a lot of protest in DC without explicitly saying what they are just a sort of turmoil that kids that are in college now well before COVID we're, we're dealing with Right. It, it, did you work with psychopaths in your professional capacity? No, it's actually, um, I, a, a, a bunch of my friends were clinicians. It's pretty uncommon to come across one. It's more likely that um, someone ends up in therapy, not because they're a psychopath or have antisocial personality disorder, um, because those people don't go to therapy because they don't think something's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll see them in therapy if their spouse drags them and it's like, why is my marriage not working? Because you're married to a psychopath. <laughs> um, or, like, or they're ordered to go to therapy or something. They're, they're not coming in being like, why is my life a complete disaster and everyone leaves me? Um, so it's usually like, so it's, it's very uncommon. Like, you know, I clinic, if I know if a friend who's a clinician, they might have had like one who they kind of think might be, but it's not that common. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Now, one thing all three of us have done is we've written books that take place in a fictional university. Uh, I, I have a tower university. It's kind of loosely based on my alma mater, Michigan State. You guys each have, have these fictional universities. Yours is in D.C., yours is in the South. Why a fictional one? Why not Vanderbilt? Why, you know, why not G Georgetown? Um, I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> and I, I thought also, you know, this will if I make it fictional, then none of my college friends will be reading this text trying to figure out who they are <laughs> in the book. That uh, it, They still did that. Um, I still get texts all the time. But no, I um, was determined to write a college setting. Um, first of all, as a reader, I'm obsessed with campus, campus novels. I didn't realize e at the time that I was writing in my dreams, you know, in, in fairly isolation, that I was writing a dark academic novel like every other thriller, um, that th thriller writer um, that year. But I just think there's, it's like a modern take on a locked room sort of setting. So you've got this like closed campus. You have all of these people who would probably, their lives wouldn't normally intersect, thrown together. Um, and you know, 
college is a time when emotions are high. Um, it's a time when people are figuring out who they are. Um, there's alcohol, there's parties, like it's just, it creates the perfect set of high stakes. So I was really drawn, drawn to that setting for that. What about um, you, Vera? Yeah, my, my book takes place at John Adams University in DC, which is clearly a play on George Washington University right. where I went to school. And I didn't want to set it at GW because I wanted to create what the college would be exactly in my mind. It was sort of a mishmash of G the way GW looks and, and this fictional place. Um, and place is really important to me. And like, I, you know, I drew maps and stuff. Mm. The thing that's interesting about GW is that it's, it's in the city, but it's still a campus where it feels like insular. And like, similarly, I like the like locker room feel of like a campus um, where it's like a closed location. Everyone's forced to interact with each other. Um, and I think a lot of people are nostalgic for college. Uh, and, and that whole like dorm room and like frat parties and that kind of like nonsense and also being of an age where you're so earnest but also figuring out your identity and like trying to figure out what you want to do for a living and it's just, I, I mean I could read like a million college novels, like I, I can never get enough of them. Um, and if you were ever a, a fan of Veronica Mars, like season three was in college, and I was like, I could just stay here forever <laughs> with her, and then the show got canceled. Right. Well, I, I chose the college setting myself because I, as a sex crimes prosecutor, like sex crimes is such a major thing in college. One in five girls will be sexually assaulted by the time they graduate from college, and so that seemed like something I, I needed to take on, kind of head on. And it's something, I, now we didn't actually prepare, I don't know if you guys want to talk about this element or not, but you guys touch on this too in your books and I, I think this is a kind of a major part of every woman's life and it's kind of a fear we all kind of carry with us from the time we're kids and we're kind of warned about particularly in college and I and I just wonder if you want to talk about kind of that angle how you decided to uh, how to approach that particular danger or that fear for women in that setting yeah I'll, I'll jump in and say you know I'm pretty I'm pretty open about this just because I think to um, borrow from Selena Gomez, um, who recently said, you know, mentioning, I think she said something like, mentioning something is like making it um, addressable mm -hmm. and um, solvable. So, you know, I knew that part of Jessica's experience um, in at college would be with, um, you know, s with sexual assault. And I, I came to that, I think, from a really real place. I don't know if, if other women have had this experience, but um, you know, as you age, reflecting back on your your college experience or or younger years, and thinking, with everything I know now, um, wow, some of those encounters I had look really suspect, mm -hmm. and they look very different now, um, and that is both like a, a it's a painful thing, um, and so so much of in my dreams, it is about like the nostalgia and a group of people um, going back to college and confronting what happened ten years ago, who they were ten years ago, and um, seeing it in a different light. And so I knew that that was, I guess, a, an experience from my own life that I wanted to process, I guess, through fiction. Right. I think um, my book is very explicitly about female rage mm -hmm. um, and impotence that we feel about these specific issues. I did the first major rewrite during the, um, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, which oh, regardless gosh. of how you feel about him, there was a lot of talk about sexual assault and mm -hmm. women walking around that week feeling like angry and impotent and no one's listening to me. And I think part of the reason that women glom on to Chloe is that she's like, I'm going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I have a 27 point plan and I will succeed. Yeah, it's kind of this female fantasy. Yeah, it is. It's it's a revenge fantasy in some ways. Um, and like nobody is rooting for the for the victim to right. avoid being killed right. here. Right, it's like, go get all. Will Bachman. Get and I Will. deliberately, like, Will Bachman is not a mega genius, like, you know, Ted Bundy type. He's a very banal type of person who did something wrong, who if he had gone, I was thinking of Brock Turner when yeah, I wrote him, yeah, yeah. that if, if mm -hmm. he went to court, his parents would be like, he's a good boy. Mm -hmm. um, I just had this feeling like, what if Brock Turner's parents were in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
like that is the type of like day to day, you know, awful thing that happens all the time. Uh, and I was like, you know, that happens all the time, but like at once in a million times if that happens and you pick the wrong victim, you know. Yeah. That's a great what if, yeah. and that, that, that plays out there. I, I wonder too, uh, you know, you're from DC, so it makes sense to set things here, but is DC a particularly good place for a psychopath to blend in? <laughs> <laughs> I also study politics. Um, you know, the reason I set the book in DC, well, like, I love DC. I've lived there for almost 20 years. Um, a lot of books that take place there, A, are about politics. And, like, people don't even know that normal people live there and just, like, go about their day-to-day -day lives. And I've also read a lot of books that take place in DC or in other cities I live in that are not, where, where all the characters are white when the city is dramatically diverse. So, um, you know, there's some diversity in the book and they talk about some of the, these racial issues. So I just kind of wanted a, a more, like, this is actually, like, kind of what it's like to live there. Yeah. Right. Ashley, you actually studied writing before you took a crack at it, unlike me. I, I, I came at it from the legal side. And you studied it, and, and you got this very prestigious degree in American literature from Southern Methodist. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how both that um, very disciplined approach to this craft and how doing that in the South has uh, influenced your writing. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> it, it uh, was a stumbling block, I think. It was an obstacle. Um, you know, it took me a long time to be able to unwind six years of a PhD program and looking at books from that kind of more analytical perspective to be able to find my own voice and and write. Um, I, I, for me at least, they're very different parts of the brain. Um, and when I find myself slipping into PhD voice mm -hmm. when I write, I'm like, okay, nope, we're, let's back up, let's erase. Um, but I will say it gave me fascinating insight into academia. Um, and I think there's probably another novel somewhere in the future about like the inner workings of, of academia. Um, but I will say that it was more, more my undergrad experience that informed um, in my dreams going to a school um, that labeled itself the uh, Harvard of the South, um, much like 15 other southern-based, you know, uh, <laughs> universities. And I, what I felt there and have since, like, ob observed since, is, like, I really wanted to capture that feeling of going to a school like Wake Forest or Vanderbilt or, or Duke and that chip-on-the-shoulder feeling, you know, that, like, second best, not an Ivy, because um, I felt like that was just the perfect setting to mirror the psychology and what's going on in the heads of all of the characters who are of course very obsessed with hierarchy status and and their fear of being second best right yeah. Um, all right, so we, I've got my signal that we've got five minutes until we open the floor to questions. We'll have ten minutes for questions at the end. So if you got questions, get them ready. We'll get to them in five minutes. So I think this might be my last question to you guys. I'm just curious about your process. In my experience, uh, writers are either pantsers or plotters. See, you either right by the seat of their pants, you kind of have an idea, you know what your characters are, and you kind of om, um, and it comes to you, and it's this magical process. <laughs> or you're like me, I'm a lawyer, so everything's an outline, and every, everything is very, like, I know the end before I know the beginning, and it's a chess game for me of setting up the characters and putting out the clues, and it's, it's right, for writing a mystery is very, um, almost like a mathematical puzzle to give the reader that experience. So I'm wondering for you guys, is, how, how is your process and when do you, I know you also are writing around day jobs, so what's your process, how do you find time? I am currently in search of a new process <laughs> because <laughs> the one that I've used to write my, my previous books is no longer working for me. Um, so I'm going to take a stab at maybe pantsing um, and see what it's about. But normally my, my process is about as meth sounds as methodical as yours, Allison. Just um, very, very detailed outlines 
42 page outlines where I'm just trying to write as much as I possibly can. I actually have to plot out the entire book before I can start writing it. Yeah. Um, and for In My Dreams, I was the most methodical um, in that I took my outline, printed it, taped it on the wall of my office, um, color-coded all of the different plot lines because I wanted to be able to see like the, the rainbow of plot lines intersecting to make sure that I was yeah. you know, doing it all evenly. I've done that too with the yeah. different color cards yeah. to represent a different plot line. Yeah, you both have these very complicated plots, which are like yeah. very hard for a debut novelist to take on. So hat tip for, to both of you <laughs> for those mechanisms. Vera, how about you? What's your process? Uh, yeah, I use a really detailed outline um, and I pretty much plot. I know the ending before you know I start writing. Uh, you know, writing doesn't mean sitting down and, and typing. Writing for me could be like, I'm thinking about something while I'm weightlifting or like walking or showering. Um, I have, I use an extremely detailed plot line because I sometimes only have an hour to write, you know, like after work, before the gym. That's, I, most of this book was written between 6 and 7 p.m. on weekdays. Mm -hmm. um, and like my current book, which is like much larger, I, like the outline I wrote is like 40,000 words. It's like super detailed. Wow. I need to figure everything out because it's complicated. There's multiple POVs. And I just, like, I don't really understand pantsing. It's sort of like building a house without a blueprint. And yeah, then that's why you have to do serious rewriting because right, you, your right. structure didn't make sense. So um, I, I feel like you need that skeleton there. And you can kind of move things around. But, like, you need, a, you need like, a backbone. Yeah. 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 Now, I, for my first couple books, I was still working at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I would write, I would get up at 5, I would write till 7. And, and I would turn my wife off, turn my phone off. That was my that was my time, and that's my advice. If any of you are thinking of writing a novel, take the, the you know give yourself two hours a day and make it sacred. Mm -hmm. Turn it, everything off. Tell your kids not to knock, and you, you know that is your time. That is your promise to yourself. Mm -hmm. How did you guys fit it in, and what's your advice to other people who are thinking of writing novels, getting their story out there? I would say like figure out what works for you. What works for you might be different than other people. Like. Um, Wake, waking up early, especially like if you have kids, that might be like a thing. Like, you, you, I would say like you don't have to kill yourself to do something, and like people always make it seem like you could only do it if you sacrifice everything. I don't think that's true. You just need to be really efficient. No, yeah. I sacrificed everything, Vera. <laughs> you just need to be really efficient with the time that you have, and not spend a lot of time being like, oh, I'm a writer. Like, no, sit down and type. Right. Um, that's the only way to actually be a writer is to write, and like yeah. a lot of people struggle with that, the latter part. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I wrote dreams in like the eat from probably 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. after um, day job work, and then as much as I could on the weekends. So um, completely agree. Just it's it's about sitting down and and making it work and. Um, turning, uh, blocking websites on your computer that tempt yeah. you to um, spend time on them. Um, and I think it helps if you're, if you treat your story, um, you know, if, you, if you're really in love and engaged with the story you're telling, um, you know, you find yourself dreaming all day of the moment that you're gonna o crack open the Word doc and get back to it. Um, so that kind of helps yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I find that also that writing a novel is very s similar in some ways that people don't think, but it's like digging a ditch. People think a lot of it is like inspiration, but a lot of it is just like get down there and shovel yes. the dirt. Like yeah, that that day, just get make some of it happen, and yep. you just have to do it at little bit every day. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. I think it is time to open the floor for questions. So, we have what the, our first brave soul. Right. Um, I'd love if you guys each maybe say why you do it. Like, what's your motivation? Like, is it oh. no. The mic is mine. <laughs> why, why do you do it? What's the motivation? Like, are you aiming for? Are you looking to enter yourself? Did you watch a lot of when you were little? <laughs> um, I think, like, I think writing is something you fall into if you read a lot, which is not, but not all readers turn into writers. I think writers are often people that read things and are like, well, I don't know, I kind of would have liked it 
if X. And for me, it was I kind of would have liked it if we had a, like a smarter female protagonist. Um, I think a lot of writers probably spent a lot of time daydreaming as kids and like being bored, to be honest, in school. School was so boring. <laughs> Stay in school. <laughs> Get a PhD. Yeah. So 10 years of it. Um, yeah, I will say I, that was a, I'll have a much more dramatic drama queen um, answer, but just that I felt like this incredible urge to take what I was feeling and thinking and put it on the page whether or not anyone would ever look at it. Um, you know, in fact, I started writing this telling myself no one would ever see it. Mm. And that's how I was brave enough to put some of the darkest and ugliest things that were in my head on the page. Um, so, you know, it's still an interesting experience to have it be out in the world. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was just like this need. It was gonna come out somehow and, um, yeah, they say, actually, they say um, that publishing a novel is like walking down the street in your underpants. Yes. You know, it, you're, you've, you've, so much of yourself is out there. So it, it does take a certain kind of either bravery or blinders or, you know, just courage. Mix of all of that, yeah. All of that, yeah. And I, I, what I started with was I, I was a big reader, just like Vera said, but I also was in this crazy, intense job, and I, I was processing on my desk every day were the worst things that happened to human beings, and I think for me, writing was cheaper than therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Just raise your hand. There we go. Yeah. Hey. In the back row. Oh, yeah. I was just curious what it was like. Um, I know you released a romance book recently. No. Oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering what, if there, what it was like. Your second one's a romance. Was there a different strategy you went about writing? Or was it the same strategy, just different plots and points? I was just curious. That's a great question. I love that. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I did put out a romance in April, and I, I thought to myself, OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a really likable character, um, and she will, you know, it'll be sunshine and um, and happy endings, and then that has not been the, like the, it turns out that I'm incapable of writing likable women, um, and so the reviews have assured me of, of that, the reader reception. Um, but yeah, no, I, I had a lot of time between when I sold In My Dreams and um, when it came out. I actually wrote two books, um, waiting for dreams to come out and trying to channel all my anxiety and, um, and nerves. And so I started writing my romance in March 2020 when the world shut down. Um, and I realized that I needed if I leaned into like the, my darkness and fear of failure with dreams, that was cathartic in one way, but I needed to repair my relationship with the world, I guess, mm -hmm. in a way. Like I needed to write a book in which, you know, it was a comedy, so everything was going to be okay in the end. And that was really important for me. I guess all my books are self-soothing projects. Uh, <laughs> I'm hearing now as I, as I say this out loud. Um, but I used the exact same method which, um, I, like I said, is just now failing me. But um, one thing I did differently with Fool Me Once is just read the entire thing out loud to my sister yeah. to try to get that comedy right. Oh, nice. Yeah. What a great idea. Yeah, that actually, it, are there more questions? Yes. What's next? Yeah, good question. What's next? Um, I'm, I'm working on um, a, a bigger book that's it's sort of an homage to Stephen King's It. It's not really a horror novel. Nice. It's about a group of um, high school kids in a small former mining town where there's a giant megachurch and there's a mass murder attached to the megachurch and they are investigating it. They end up killing the uh, charismatic pastor and then they have to return back to that town 20 years later because even though they killed him, he is still somehow alive. Sounds fascinating. Okay, cannot wait for that. Um, <laughs> I have a thriller coming out in August called The Last Housewife, um, and it is, I describe it as my cult revenge thriller. So it is a little bit eyes wide shut meets promising young woman, mm -hmm. if you can kind of like mash those together. So I go back to college for a little while, um, and then 
kind of explode into the world of, of cults um, after that. So nice. Yeah. This one. I'm going to repeat that for our camera. D do we do our own marketing or do our publishers do that? So there's, marketing is different than publicity. So like you're probably thinking of publicity. So the marketing is more like them buy, your publisher buying ad space on Amazon or something. Publicity is like events like this. So um, you're, when, you have, when you go with a big five, they're going to do the marketing. You're expected to do some amount of publicity. Um, and, and kind of everyone has their own gauge of how much they can physically do. Uh, it was, and also our books came out during the pandemic, so a lot of it was via Zoom or, you know, podcasts, that type of thing. I'll just say, like, thank God, no, because yes, I, <laughs> um, I would be ter Those are completely different skills. Um, so luckily, your publisher is the one, um, if you're fortunate enough, of course, your publisher is out there doing marketing and, and looking for, for opportunities on your behalf. And you just have to, if you're an introverted writer like me, just kind of like uh, psych yourself up for everything. And that's what you're responsible for. <laughs> Yeah, they are. They're such different skills. The yeah. writing is so solitary and it's so internal. And then the marketing, you, in my experience, it's generally hybrid. Your, your publisher will do some for you and you can do as much or as little as you want. And how bad do you want it? So I wanted it bad. So I did a lot. I, I started blogging. That's how I started, became a TV critic. I started blogging about what TV crime dramas were getting right and wrong. Not because like I needed more writing to do, but because it drew so many eyeballs. It got a, it made a big bang, and I, I actually really grew my platform through that. So, um, but it, that was a a lot of work. So um, I, I think there's there's being a writer and an author, and then there's being like a published author where you sort of have to be a PR person, a business person managing your own money and paying mm -hmm. taxes, um, and networking, and that those are different skill set. You could yes. be a really good writer and be terrible yes. at all the other agreed. things. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I was like, what do you mean? What public? Uh, <laughs> yeah, taxes, public speaking. Um, I know. My publisher was like, you need to get a Facebook account. I was like, no, not a Facebook account. <laughs> Yes. You know, that <laughs> totally different stuff. Yeah. How are we how are we doing on time, Ava? Oh, seven minutes. Great. Okay, great. I seven saw another hand over And the period. mic is live. <laughs> <laughs> and I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Um, thank you. So part of the being uh, reading a thriller is the dead ends that where you think somebody else did it. Um, are those plotted out, or do you just try out what other um, what other people might do to make us think that they they're the ones who did it? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think the inclusion of red herrings is kind of, is kind of, the problem with writing a mystery is that. Some readers approach it from the perspective of so desperately wanting to know who did it that they suspect everyone, <laughs> and then that can lead to like different feelings about whether or not it's that person. Like for me, it's it's the answer to the mystery is less interesting than how the characters solve it. Mm -hmm. So like yes, there's red herrings and there's like you can suspect everyone in my book, um, and you're sort of supposed to. And I'll put in like little things that like well this guy this frat guy is way too nice. He's probably a murderer. <laughs> So I know that they're gonna think that way, so I'll put that stuff there on person, uh, on purpose. That is good life advice, also. Um, yeah, I my plotting, you know, I was very purposefully trying to make readers believe everyone was was a potential killer, um, and so, you know, that was that was meticulously plotted in advance and. As I was writing it, I was like, okay, I don't know if I'm gonna convince, you know, there's a lot of really sophisticated readers who've read a lot of mysteries and thrillers. They're probably really good um, at ferreting out who who did it. I have a lot of twist pressure, I feel, in my head, you know? Yeah. Um, and I thought, okay, well, to your point, Vera, even if someone figures out who is the killer, it's that why that is the thing that um, is so satisfying and what you're ultimately reading the book for is like the explanation of what the motivation was, at least I am as a, as a reader. And so I thought in my heart that even if someone guessed who my killer was, they wouldn't guess why. So that's kind of, yeah. 
There, okay. I'm on my way with the mic, and let's hear a little thank you to the Saw audio visual crew who made this all so smooth. I have a question about how you s process things. Like, you know, there are a lot of people who will write a book that has this character talking one chapter, then another character is introduced, and it's his thoughts, and another character. And other people do a book that's, I guess it's sequential, mm -hmm. and the whole storyline goes like that. How do you as a writer determine an avenue that works for you for that book? Uh, do you do you run through different thoughts? I mean, do they teach that in school? <laughs> like <laughs> things? Or if you don't go to writing school, how do you know that? Um, intuition. I love that question, first of all. And I think about it for a long time with each new book, how to tell this story. Um, with Dreams, I felt like I was pulling out a lot of tricks. And, and a little bit it was planned. It's told in dual timelines, so past and present. Um, and it is mostly told from Jessica Miller, the protagonist's point of view. But as I was writing, I realized that there were some things that Jessica just did not know um, and could not know that I needed to put. And I, so I wrote myself into a corner and realized that I needed to do a multi-POV book. And so I have a few chapters, very sparse, um, from other people's point of view. And I, I realized that those POV moments would be confessions. And so that's kind of, it totally did, yeah. Um, my book is multiple POV where there's a first person narrator, which is Chloe, and then there's other narrators. And then when other psychopaths are introduced, they, they get to be third person POV. Um, and I did that on purpose because I am really an old fashioned writer. I don't like when the writer like tricks you and that's how the mystery works. So I wanted the withholding of clues to be based on, well, we don't have this person's POV yet. And then once we do, we get more information. Mm -hmm. But also when you switch out of Chloe's POV into this, her therapist POV, you get to see how he sees her and then you, how she represents herself and how it comes off. So these are all people who are constantly manipulating each other and have different motivations. So the different POVs, you get to see them, each character from like a three-dimensional perspective by looking at, th at them through the eyes of other characters. I think we have time for one more question, if we have one more question. And if we don't, I have a question for you guys. <laughs> So, what, so actually, you kind of mentioned uh, reading reviews, and you mentioned that you're writing to an audience you're mm -hmm. with a reader in mind. And I'm wondering, how has your experience been getting the feedback of reviews, both professional reviews and reviews that you know people write on Amazon, on Goodreads, those, those sort of things? Yeah, I, um, I was very eager and and thrust myself into like the world of Bookstagram and. Um, engaging with readers and, and reading a lot of reviews, I think, early after the book was published. And I realized um, how detrimental and unhealthy that was, mm -hmm. even if the reviews were positive, um, because it was just too many voices in my head. Mm -hmm. And I lived day to day with, you know, the un... un named person, reader. So I've blocked pretty much all review sites. Don't don't go, I still engage a little bit on Bookstagram, but I've had to learn. Um, you actually like used your blocking software. Yes. Wow, um, good I, for you. Just, I, I just had to learn. And I think every writer will be different. And when I talk to 2022 debuts and I, I tell them like, just don't don't go there. Don't look. Um, and they're like, okay, but I have to. So I think it's just a journey everyone has yeah. to go through on their own. I had a reviewer uh, last week accuse me of believing in eugenics. Oh my Not gosh. sure where they got that. It's wrong. Um, I think that my personal theory is that when someone writes a super harsh review of you, it's because they wanted to be a writer and they're angry that your bad book got published and theirs didn't. Um, but. I think that you have to imagine, the audience you should be imagining, imagine the best possible reader that loves your work. That is the audience you're writing for, not the person yeah. who thinks that I believe in you, Yeah, yeah, agreed. So like you, you, you end up being paralyzed if you're thinking about, you know, in real life, you don't want to be friends with every single person. There's at least five people out of 100 who you would like hate. Like you, you don't want to write to those people. Mm -hmm. You want to write to the readers who are like you. Yeah. Well, I have to say, as a, you know, 
as a writer myself, reading your guys' books, you are awesome writers. I loved both of your books, and you guys should all buy them. These are stars. So thank you.